Well, uh, before I get started this morning, I just want to I just want to talk briefly about uh, finances, which is what I know you all love to hear about. Now, I just normally this time of the year, end of the year. Um, y- yes, Charlie. Um, I okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I will. Uh, if we can all lift up Joe. Yeah, that's all right. If we could all lift up uh, Joe as she drives back today uh, from visiting Joey, that would be great. Um, yeah, I'll include that in my prayer. Um, I just want to briefly cover this morning um, uh, the finances. Uh, towards the end of the year, we always just want to remind ourselves where we're at uh, giving. I'm not preaching on tithing today. I'm not going to give you a, a detailed just usually want to give everyone an update to where we're at as we, as we come into the end of the year, uh, uh, both as a church and as the Alliance. Uh, I just want to let you know, as a church, we're, we're doing well. We're on a, on a good path. We haven't fallen behind. Uh, we're, we're in a good spot financially uh, as a church, and I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for that. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, we are slightly under our giving uh, projection for the year, our giving goal for the year as a body, and so um, I do encourage you, if you, if you are uh, willing and, and able to make an end-of-year gift to just help us uh, meet our budget, that's helpful both to our, our budgeting committee uh, and to our church as we continue to give. Um, we thank you for your faithfulness and in your joy for supporting us as your local church. Uh, the Alliance also is having generally a good year, giving in support of glo- the global mission and the global work that we do. Uh, the Great Commission Fund, uh, uh, obviously we're in this new season, uh, but the Great Commission Fund is or was about, uh, I think about 8% behind uh, giving on giving this year of where they would like to be. And so uh, I strongly and freely encourage you, if you're able, to make an end-of-the-year gift to the Great Commission Fund, the Alliance's Fund for the work we do around the world. Uh, I, I invite you to do that. Uh, you can do that online at the Alliance's website. Uh, cmalliance.org. We have information in our lobby uh, about about the work the Alliance does around the world and, and giving to Alliance missions. Uh, you can also do it through our church, either through our church website uh, or these envelopes that are in our offering boxes on the back. You can just put uh, fill out the envelope, say Great Commission Fund back there, and that'll get to where it needs to go. But uh, let's make one last push towards giving, towards uh, the work the Alliance does around the world. The Alliance is a world class mission sending organization uh there really in my opinion is no one that does it better so uh please support them in that work um as we end near the end of the year here all right let's dig in uh sometime around the age of seven my mom decided that it was time to introduce my brother and i to one of her favorite uh movies uh she was so excited My mom decided to sit us down to watch Star Wars. All right? The coolest movie franchise of all time. Uh, We borrowed the VHS tapes from my uncle. And uh, VHS tapes were these things that we used to... Anyways. um, And uh, we we put them in the VCR. And from that moment on, my brother Chaz and I were absolutely hooked. I mean, we were Star Wars junkies. We watched The Return of the Jedi so many times that the tape got stuck in the VCR and broke the whole thing. That's how many times we watched it, okay? Uh, it was just incredible. Anyways, at the climax of the first movie, at the climax of A New Hope, uh, Luke, uh, the main character, is in his X-Wing. And he's barreling down this narrow trench of the Empire's planet-destroying space station, the Death Star, Okay? And Luke and the other pilots are tasked with attacking the Death Star's only weakness, a two-meter thermal port at the end. And that thermal port leads directly to the reactor system. And a direct hit with a photon, photon torpedo in the thermal port will cause a reaction that will destroy the Death Star. And so Luke and the other pilots plunge at this weakness with everything they have, and most don't even make it. But in the final moments, when all hope is lost, Luke is at the end of the trench. And he fires, and, okay, spoiler alert, cover your ears if you don't want to know how it ends, okay? Uh, he hits the target, and moments later, the, the death tower explodes with a resounding boom. Even though there's no noise in space, it booms anyways, and... The good guys win, and they celebrate and get badges and medals. Oh, wow, great film, huh? 
What a great franchise. Yeah. Okay, clapping for Star Wars. Okay, cool. Uh, Sometimes, folks, sometimes, in the midst of all the songs about shepherds and angels, uh, let alone thinking about Santa Claus and the Grinch, uh, sometimes uh, around Christmas we get a a little off target, yes? Sometimes we forget what we are celebrating. Now, I'm not here to scold you, okay? I love Christmas. I love the Grinch. Uh, I love all that stuff. This isn't a scolding sermon, but sometimes we just get a little off track, a little off target, and a little unaligned. In a single word, Christmas is the celebration of the Incarnation. The celebration of God the Son who took on flesh 2,000 years ago through the miraculous virgin birth in order that we who are flesh might have a champion. He came and took on flesh that we might have a redeemer, a substitute, a savior. And this is what Christmas is truly about. This is what we are celebrating. And with that in view, I want to spend our time this morning in the trench uh, getting ourselves on target, leading us into some textual and theological study on the incarnation of the Christ. Okay, I know that it's early, okay? Uh, but, but take a large gulp of coffee. Uh, you're going to be all right. We're going to dig in together with me because because this doctrine, this truth, uh, is essential to the Christian faith. The Incarnation is not some obscure or secondary doctrine. It's at the core of who we are. The Incarnation is at the core of what we believe. The Gospel message isn't complete without it. And so this morning we're going to do our best to grasp it through one of the key texts. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 26. Luke chapter 1, we'll start in verse 26. We're going to look at the angel's announcement to Mary and her response. So uh, you can follow along on the screen behind me if you'd like. But Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, says this. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days Mary arose and went in haste into the hill country uh, to the town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And he said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, 
He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, in humble gratitude for your love, your mercy, your grace to us. Thank you, Lord, for the gift and the sacrifice of your Son. Father, I I lift up to you right now, uh, Joe Gleason, as she drives back, Lord. Please keep her safe, Lord. Please uh, give her peace and and confidence as she drives, Lord. Please protect her. But Father, I pray for this service this morning. I pray for this time gathered here, gathered around your word, gathered as one body in fellowship, one with another. I pray, God, that you would meet with us here in a new way and in a fresh way, Lord. Meet with us in your word. Meet with us in the glory of the coming of your Son. Lord, we pray this all in your name, the name of our God, our faithful one. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, the human brain takes comfort in patterns, doesn't it? Uh, I do like patterns. And so uh, after last week, I'm going to keep our pattern going this morning. Uh, we're going to focus on the grand truths taught in the text in points number one and two before we turn to look at the very human experience of those involved at the end of point number three. Uh, we're going to cover kind of the theology of the text in the first parts of the sermon before getting to the story of the text in the final part. So, uh, right at the start, the big truth of our text this morning, point number one, Jesus is Son of God who took on flesh. Point number one this morning, Jesus is Son of God who took on flesh. For right now, I really want to focus on the words that Gabriel, the angel, spoke to Mary when describing what was about to occur. I want to focus in on those verses at the first half of this chapter. In verses 31 through 32, uh, Gabriel tells Mary that she will conceive and give birth to a son. And then it goes on to say that this child is the son of the Most High. Most High being there a title for God himself. The angel says that you will bear a son who will be the son of God. And then Gabriel goes on to say that this son is the fulfillment of all Old Testament messianic hope. I mean, wow, Mary is going to give birth to the Messiah and this son will be considered God's son. And this statement alone, of course, is incredible and earth-shattering and epoch-bending. It's about as big a statement as we've seen so far in the scriptures. But where it gets even more interesting is what happens after Mary asks how this is going to occur in verse 34. Uh, You see, she hadn't been given any timetable. Uh, The word for conceive in verse 31 is in the future tense, yes, Uh, but it has no modifiers to indicate uh, if it's the immediate future or in a few years or even down the road in a decade. There's there's no clarity, just future. And so Mary asks the angel for clarification. She is engaged, but as of yet unmarried. She's a virgin, never having any sexual relations with a man. And so she's asking the angel whether this child is going to come later on through her marriage to Joseph, her fiancé, or is it going to come in some other way? What does God have in mind for her? Well, the angel's answer in verse 35 is both mysterious and yet abundantly clear. This child is not going to be conceived through the normal and natural means by which all children are regularly made. No, this child is going to be formed in her uniquely by God. And formed in such a way that the Son of God is born to her through a miraculous virgin conception and a miraculous virgin birth. Wow. The words describing this process in the verses, the words come upon and overshadow are mysterious. I mean, obviously this is an event that only occurs once, right, in all of human history. So we really shouldn't expect to have 
uh, comparable processes to observe and examine, right? Where well, we don't have experiments we can line up in incarnational sciences. That doesn't work that way. No, but, but the language does clearly convey this. It conveys that at the moment of conception, uh, which would occur in the days to come, at the moment of conception, God would bring forth a child in her womb without any sexual relations. And, and from what we can see here, and then also uh, from we can see, looking from the results backwards, we know that God the Creator will form the child in the womb of Mary in such a way that he could truly be called both, yes, the Son of Mary and also the Son of God. That's what we know. The words overshadow, the words come upon is that God is going to form this child in her womb in this way. By the revelation of the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth, uh, her cousin or her relative, confirms this truth in verse 43. What did she call Mary? Did you pick that up? She called Mary the mother of my Lord. Just an incredible statement. Now, the following pregnancy and birth were physiologically normal as far as anyone can tell, all right? But the surrounding circumstances of the birth were anything but. I mean, come on, rejoicing angels and bowing shepherds and visits from magi and king. Uh, it was just incredible. The result of all of this, the result of God's work, the result was Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man from the moment of his conception. Fully God and fully man in every moment following. Fully man and fully God and even today as he sits at his Father's right hand in the heaven. The result is the Son, the second person of the Trinity who took on human form and human likeness, as it says in Philippians chapter 2. He took on a full human nature. And so there you really have it, the incarnation. And with it, the doctrine of the nature and the person of Christ. As John 1.14 puts it, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Son has come. And He's come and took on flesh to become one of us. A human being, God in human form. Lewis Berry Chafer further describes it this way. He says, The incarnation is the entrance of the second person of the eternal Godhead into the human sphere, partaking of the human elements, body, soul, and spirit, with a distinct purpose of remaining a partaker of all that is human for all eternity to come. True, that in him which was mortal has put on immortality, and he has been and is now glorified with the highest glory known to infinity. Uh, the Son has taken on all human elements. Uh, to put it more simply, Wayne Grudem says it this way, In the person of Jesus, God physically entered into our world. An infinite God came to live in a finite world. In Jesus, God and man became one person. A person unlike anyone else the world has ever seen or will ever see. Jesus Christ was and forever will be fully God and fully man in one person. Church, this doctrine of the incarnation, this doctrine of the word God become flesh is a core gospel component. It's an essential belief. It's an issue of our orthodoxy. The Son must become flesh and remain God and man forever in order to bring salvation to any human being. The virgin birth is the method that we must believe and the incarnation is the result that we must believe. To reject this truth is to reject the faith. To reject this truth is to reject the scripture and with it ultimately to reject the gospel. Unbelief in the incarnation is unbelief in the gospel. It's that critical. It's that important. It's that central to who we are. This is the core, the foundation, the building block of the faith. Anyone who rejects this doctrine is truly, in its, in its most literal form, is truly a heretic and is therefore condemned to hell unless they repent and believe in the incarnate Son. If anyone teaches anything other than this, they are a false teacher and they're to be rejected and condemned. And if someone comes and they claim to have received from God an alternative truth, an alternative 
theory to this doctrine. They are a false prophet and they are to be cast out. We can't play around with this. We can't mess with this. This is the doctrine of the faith. It's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of heaven and hell, a gospel matter, an essential matter. It's that important. Nothing else matters if this doesn't matter. And I promise you, I'm not overstating my case, okay? This has been recognized and taught and preached as essential orthodoxy by the church throughout the centuries everywhere that has, the church has ever been. This is the gospel news of the faith. Let's go on a little tour through history, shall we? Okay, I only had one quote last week, so I have like eight this week, all right? We'll just go with it, all right? Let's go on a little tour. First of all, the Apostles' Creed, the earliest statement of the faith that we have uh, from the second century AD says this, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. The early apostles recognized the centrality of this truth. The Nicene Creed in the fourth century says it this way, And in one, Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence of the Father. Through him all things were made, and then that's the God part, now the man part, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human, fully God and fully man. After the Reformation, the Belgic Confession of 1561 states it this way with a lot of thoroughness. It says this, So then we confess that God fulfilled the promise made to the early fathers and mothers by the mouth of the holy prophets when he sent the one and only eternal Son of God into the world at the time appointed. The Son took the form of a slave and was made in human form, truly assuming a real human nature, with all its weaknesses except for sin, being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit without male participation. And Christ not only assumed human nature as far as the body is concerned, but also a real human soul in order to be a real human being. For since the soul had been lost as well as the body, Christ had to assume them both to save them both together. Therefore, we confess that Christ shared the very flesh and blood of children, being the fruit of the loins of David according to the flesh, descended from David according to the flesh, the womb of the the fruit of the womb of the Virgin Mary, born of a woman, the seed of David, the root of Jesse, descended from Judah, having descended from the Jews, according to the flesh, descended from Abraham, having assumed descent from Abraham and Sarah, and was like his brothers and sisters, yet without sin. In this way, Christ is truly our Emmanuel, that is, God with us. I think this was probably a Belgian Belgian lawyer slash theologian, if I was... Taking a guess there, my goodness. But they want to be clear, it's that important. You can't even get a piece of this right without being in trouble. Lastly, our own statement of faith. The Christian Missionary Alliance statement of faith. It's both our denominations and our own. They say it very succinctly. Jesus Christ is true God and true man. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. We believe in the Incarnation. We believe in the doctrine that God the Son took on flesh and dwelt among us. We believe in the miracle of the virgin birth by which God formed this child in the womb of a human being that that God might come, that a man might come and be one of us. My favorite theologian, Charles Ryrie, says this. He says, Thus the incarnation has ramifications in relation to our knowledge of God, to our salvation, to our daily living, to our pressing needs, and to the future. It truly is the central fact of history. The incarnation. This doctrine is clearly taught in the text of Scripture. It is testified to by the triune God. It is a historical fact as testified by eyewitnesses and the apostles. It has been universally affirmed by the true church for the last 2,000 years. It is essential to our faith. 
and critical to our hope and our salvation. I urge you, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to know it, to understand it, to study it thoroughly, to defend it with zeal, to teach it faithfully to others. And most importantly, above all else, I invite you to believe in it, to believe in the incarnation of the Son of God as you believe in any, everything else in the gospel because without it, the gospel is nothing. This is the incarnation. This is the center of our faith. Amen. Amen. Now, the incarnation is what occurred in the text, right? This is what we celebrate at Christmas. This is the, the what we're here for. But of course, now it is, what does it mean, right? Like, okay, cool information, Jared. Now what? Uh, I get it. What does it matter? What is it going to accomplish? Why is it so important? Why is it so central? Well, the answer to this is also found in the text. Point number two this morning. Jesus incarnate is the fulfillment of all promised hope. Jesus incarnate is the fulfillment of all promised hope. Without him, we have none. The beginning of Luke's gospel is just packed full of grand expectation. If he was a mystery writer, he would be the absolute worst mystery writer of all time. Okay? He gives away the whole story right up at the first page. He can't help himself. All right? He accurately records and he accurately includes all of the promise and prophecy given by the angel and by the Holy Spirit through Elizabeth and by Mary. He includes everything that he heard from them. Yes, heard from them. Luke had access to Mary, Jesus' mother, after the fact. After the cross, after the resurrection, she lived in Jerusalem for a few years. And then she was in Ephesus with John, the apostle, who who was tasked with care. And so Luke, the author of this gospel, had direct access to the eyewitness source, direct access to Mary to get this information. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, of course he did. He's a historian. And so he accurately records all of it. And in it, he includes all of the excitement that these two women were entrusted with. All of these exhilarating truths that they received decades before it was revealed to the larger world. They received this truth that Jesus is going to come to bring redemption to the world. That Jesus was the one. In fact, they knew already that no one else could be. In verses 32 through 33, the angel tells Mary that Jesus will be the one to restore and reign from David's throne over the eternal kingdom of God. Right off the bat, that Jesus is the one, the Messiah, the promised. Verses 46 through 55, she also sings a prophetic song, again, packed with Old Testament references, packed Uh, with with things that highlight all that the Son of God will come to accomplish. Jesus is the one who brings salvation to the humble and to the weak. Jesus is the one who will fulfill the covenant of blessing that was promised to Abraham. Jesus is the one that will vindicate the persecuted righteous ones. He's the one that will judge the earthly persecutors. He's the one who will come to accomplish the justice of God and the mercy of God and the salvation of God. And he will accomplish all of this and even more, just as was promised, Jesus is come to fulfill the mission of God on earth. That's why he's come. And no one else, no one else could possibly accomplish it. All right, let's get into the thick stuff again, shall we? Back into the theology, drink more coffee, you'll be fine. Okay, take a sip, everybody all right. In order to represent the human race as the perfect sacrifice for sin, Jesus did indeed need to be fully man. I'm going to say that again. In order to represent the human race as the perfect sacrifice for sin, our necessary substitute, Jesus did indeed need to be fully man. No other creature or angel or being could serve as a substitute. As Romans 5 argues, it was a man, it was Adam, who brought sin and death into the world, and therefore it had to be the man, Jesus, to die for the sins of the world. There was no one else, uh, no other being could do it. 
The New City Catechism asks this question. It says, why must the Redeemer be truly human? And then it offers the answer that in human nature, he might on our behalf perfectly obey the whole law and suffer the punishment for human sin. He had to be human to be a substitute, to be a sacrifice. Jesus had to be human. More than that, only a human being could come and fulfill the promised covenants, right? In order to align with the promise, the Messiah needs to be a physical descendant of Abraham. Through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, and then through David, just as was promised. Now Jesus was born to Mary, who happened to be descended from them all. What a coincidence, right? Uh, Mary was exactly that. She was from the tribe of Judah, and she was from the line of David. Not through Solomon, but through the, the line of Nathan, his other son. And therefore, Jesus was genetically qualified to come and to fulfill all the promises that God had made to his Old Testament people. God, Jesus was the one. Now, someone might come along and say, well, no, he's not, because yes, he's a descendant of David, but he's not a descendant of the kings from Judah. He's a descendant of David's other son. And to that, God quite, hap- quite happily took care of. Because you see, on the other side of his life was Joseph, the humble carpenter, who was a direct descendant of Solomon and the line of Judaic kings, so that when Joseph married Mary and adopted Jesus as his son, Jesus also received the firstborn right to inherit all that was due Joseph. And while they were pressed and under the thumb of the Roman Empire, and so he was a carpenter rather than a king, Joseph had the right, the right to rule on the throne of David. And Jesus, as his son, inherited that right through the adoption that Joseph gave him. You see, Jesus was the one. He was the one, the man that God called, the man that God chose. Jesus was that one, fully man. But the Messiah was only human. If the Messiah was only flesh and blood, there was no hope. Because you see, no human being could ever live a perfect, sinless life. No human being could ever fulfill the law. In fact, no human being, simple human being, was born without sin already corrupting and already condemning them. And even if there was such a person a person without sin, a single human being, a simple human being, could not die for the sins of the whole world. Maybe for the sins of one, but a life for a life doesn't do anything for us, does it? Just a man wouldn't do. Just a man couldn't be the sacrifice. Just a man couldn't be the perfect Lamb of God. So God in the power and the goodness and the wisdom that he only possesses. God sent one born of a woman, yes, to be fully human with no ambiguity. Jesus was fully man, yes, but also one eternally generated of God to be fully God, fully divine. Jesus Christ, the Son, was fully God. The incarnation is the answer. Jesus must be fully God to be the spotless lamb, free from sin and blemish and corruption, and therefore free from sin, therefore free from the penalty of death. Jesus is the only man never to deserve to die, as we all deserve to die. This is exactly who Jesus is. And Jesus must be fully God to be the sacrifice of all mankind. He must be fully God for His blood to cover all the sin of the world. And that is exactly who Jesus is. You see, Jesus must be fully God to be more than sin and death could handle. He must be exceedingly greater than the grip of sin in order to be resurrected. And that is exactly who Jesus is. The grave could not keep Him or hold Him. He was more than a man. He was fully God. 
And Jesus must be fully God to receive the praise and the adoration and the worship of all creation as promised to the Messiah for only God is worthy to be praised. And that is exactly who Jesus is. Fully God and fully man. There was no other way. Again, the New City Catechism asked, Why must the Redeemer truly God? That because of His divine nature, His obedience and suffering would be perfect and effective. And also that He would bear the righteous anger of God against sin and yet overcome death. Jesus is all of this. And Jesus is even so much more, as I have not even touched on his role as prophet and priest, intercessor and judge and righteousness and peace, and I could keep going, but that is exactly who Jesus is. And God the Father sent Jesus the Son, God incarnate, God in flesh. He sent him the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Messiah, the only one. And he sent him to come and to die and to rise from the dead to accomplish his perfect mission here on earth, to redeem the whole of creation and rescue any who might believe, you and me. That's who Jesus is. There was no one else. He was the one. And this is who we come to celebrate and worship. This is who we come to celebrate and worship in this season of rejoicing and expectation. This is the one. Jesus Christ, the Son of God in sacrifice for our sins, the King who reigns eternally, this is the target. This is what this season is all about. I know this is all a bit heady and theological in some sense, yeah? Now, for me, that's enough to excite me any day of the week, okay? I mean, I get fired up talking about uh, transubstantiation, little than this, okay? I get fired up talking about everything. But, but it's more than just theology. It's more than just doctrine, guys. It's, it's more than just head stuff. This is intimate, and, and this is personal. This is about you and I, because... We're in a relationship with Jesus, yes? We're in a relationship with the one. We are identified with him, one with him, one body in him. He is our savior, our friend, our intercessor. It's personal. And so as we enter into relationship with this one, we must know him for who he really is. We must take in all that the son is. We must take in all that he has accomplished, all that he is. And so I want to end this with point number three uh, in the text, our example and our response, our only response, point number three, Jesus is received by faith. Jesus is received by faith. As we noticed last week, in the midst of all of this grandeur, in the midst of all of this glory, in the midst of all of this incarnation, there is still, at the end of the day, a very real, very human young woman in the middle of all of it. In the middle of all of this, terif- all of this terrifying but exciting moment is, is Mary. I mean, it's a big thing. It's, it's the incarnation. On the one hand, it's thrilling, right? I mean... From everything we can know, it appears that Mary is a dutiful and devout young Jewish woman, normal in many ways. And in this big moment, God sends his special messenger angel to speak of God's great love and great fervor for her, a favor for her. God comes to her and himself and he affirms to Mary that he sees her, that he knows her. And that he is calling her to something special. He's calling her to be the mother of the Redeemer. As it says in verse 43, the mother of the Lord. It's exciting. It's, it's thrilling. She's going to have a life with the, with the purpose of all purposes. To, to bring forth the Messiah. Wow! But on the other hand, she is a normal but dutiful and devout young Jewish woman who's just been told that she is going to conceive and become pregnant before her wedding night, before she had relations with Joseph or any other man, and that this child will be formed in her womb by God, and this is terrifying, right? What will her parents do? 
What will Joseph do? What will the community do? What will the synagogue do? Will anyone believe her? Or is she going to be rejected and shamed all the days of her life? Uh, What is she going to do? Because you see, it's a big ask. It's a terrifying new reality. She's going to have a child when she's not even married yet. And she's not ready to have a child. And yet, and yet, in all of this, how does Mary respond when the angel finishes speaking? What are the words out of her mouth? Verse 38. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. At this key moment in the midst of the thrill and the terror, Mary accepts this. She believes it to be true. She trusts in it. Mary in this moment is willing to take on the call of God for her life and is ready to take on all that it will entail, relying on God for the details, relying on God for His mercy and His care and His protection. Mary responds in faith. In faith. In verses 46 through 56, she sings God's praises for His great faithfulness and His rich mercy. She celebrates what He is about to accomplish. And by the grace of God in this faith, she receives all the life-giving blessing of God in her life. She receives from Him the gift of salvation. Warren Wiersbe speaks to this saying, saying this, Mary's believing response was to surrender herself to God as his willing servant. She experienced the grace of God and believed the word of God, and therefore she could be used by the Spirit of God to accomplish the will of God. A handmaid, what she called herself, was the lowest kind of female servant, which shows just how much Mary trusted God. She belonged, she offered herself totally to the Lord, body, soul, and spirit. What an example for us to follow. Yes, what an example indeed. As I close, I want us to remember that Mary was very much a human being like you and I. She's not an angel. She's not a superhero. She's not Captain Marvel. She was a young woman who faithfully responded in faith when God called. That's who she is. And then she watched as God did the impossible in her. And then watched as God did the impossible through her as she conceived and gave birth to the Son. May we all do so well. Church, God has called you. Not just as a church. God has called you. Second person singular. God has called you. You. And he's called you to receive the incarnate Christ as your Savior, to receive him as your Lord and your Redeemer. God has called you to receive him by faith. God has called. And then, as the servant of the Lord, he has called you to receive him again every day as you surrender, every day as you follow the path. He has set you on, on His mission and after His own heart. God is calling you to faith. God is calling you to walk by faith. May we be able to say like Mary did in verse 46, My soul magnifies the Lord. My life, my all, my honor, My everything belongs to you, Lord. My life exists to bring you glory. My soul magnifies the Lord. By faith, let us pour out our life for Christ and for his glory. Let's keep on target. Keep our life on target. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, humbled. Humbled by the gift of your love and your salvation. Humbled by the gift of your Son. Lord, in your love, in your mercy, in your grace, in your favor, 
You sent your beloved one and only Lord to come into the not to come, but to come and be rejected by man in order that man might have life. God, we rejoice in the life giving, the salvation giving, the eternity giving sacrifice of your son. Lord, we are so thankful. Lord, we rejoice in his resurrection. Lord, we rejoice in the new life that we receive as the free gift of faith. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would come here again today to submit and surrender ourselves to you. May we, may we offer ourselves our all, our everything by faith to you as your servant, Lord. Not your will, but not my will, but yours be done. My soul is here to magnify you. May this be our prayer. And may this be our walk. We pray this all in your name. Amen. You please stand and join us in a song of praise.